on a sort of two month hiatus. So you'll know that we do events from January to about July, then we take two months off where we sort of go gallivanting and relax, and then we come back again in October. But wonderfully, and Ray Cardi, Nathan, who I'll be speaking about in a moment, got in touch, having been here two years ago, and said, Johnny, I'm going to be um, in town, I'll be in the country. Please, it'd be wonderful, you know, to very gracious guys, could, could you, you know, do you want to do something again here? So hence we find ourselves here at this pitching for success, this masterclass and you know, how to do a good pitch, how to do good public speaking. And just a quick show of hands, like a sort of 90s hip hop concert. Who here, for who here is this the first time you've been at a Corinth City event before? Welcome, welcome, welcome. I guess you got some, you got, you're seeing stuff about Corinth City and you've read about it, you're seeing all the hyperbole and the hubbub and the media gurning. Basically, to cut a long story short, Corinth City is both a movement and an organization. And to keep it really simple, we're all working together. There's sort of three of us in this Corinth City team, myself, Simon, Knife, and Sarah, I've just discovered I can't count. There's four. <laughs> and then there is this wider community, which is always growing with a very, very simple kind of end game. We want to make Croydon the Silicon Valley of South London. That's really what we're working towards. All of you know what Silicon Valley is like. You've either been there, or you want to go there, or you've seen it. We want to make it a place where people can come and build really cool, really exciting tech startups, software companies, creative companies. We want to make it that hub industry where creators can come, meet people, and do great things. And wonderfully, I sort of given this speech probably about 6,000 times in the past five years. Wonderfully, that's really come to fruition. When I first started, it was more like a, believe me guys, I'm not just a guy dressed like he's on work experience, like this can happen. <laughs> wonderfully, hopefully you received this two weeks ago, that um, Croydon is now the UK's fastest growing economy. Who saw that in City AM? Did anyone see that? That's incredible, and it's, it's not, I mean, you can clap me if you want to, but it's because of you, yeah. people like you who come to events like this and who believe in that growing tech city vision all that time ago, 4 or 5 October 2011. So coming up to five years ago, when you first said, guys, how can we change growing and really make it stand for something, be a place where people want to be and do great things? And so, wonderfully, you guys, it might not be lit or you guys who are just visiting for the first time, but you are in the heart of something very special. This isn't just your average identikit kind of brutalist kind of commercial town. This is a place where people are now not just building startups, but they're moving, they're moving from other parts of London, they're moving internationally to come here and set up here. And so it's just, that's just my way of saying, first of all, I guess, thank you. And uh, second of all, yeah, also thank you as well, just thank you for being here. So I guess that's my spiel for a bit. First thing I just want to do is let you know with Corinth Tech City is, it's not just the people, it's not just us as an organization, it's also the buildings. All around there are tech companies moving into these various offices. And there are also workspaces and sort of hubs where people can work and collaborate with others here. And you're in a workspace here, so you're in something called Sussex Innovation Centre Croydon. And I'm not going to sort of fluff the spiel about it. I'm going to hand over actually to centre manager, Ben Holt, to talk to you about what this building is and why he aims to be a part of it. Back to you. Thanks, Joey. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I guess I thought this would be a useful opportunity just to very briefly uh, tell you what makes Sussex Innovation Croydon different as an incubator. So we talk about an incubator as being a place that supports startups and in fact scale up, so small businesses who are ready to grow. So it's all about business growth. Now, what makes Sussex Innovation quite different? Uh, the clue isn't in the name because it's not really about Sussex. We started as a, um, uni a sort of typical university incubator, but that was 20 years ago when these things were first starting. So we're a bit ahead of the game. Uh, what's been exciting the past five years, of, well, five to ten years are two things. Well, more recently we've opened here in Croydon the past year, of course, and opening in Brighton next year. So we're extending that into an incubation network. But that's not as exciting as the fact that what we are able to do is really support businesses with a business support team, which is 12 miles strong, which is run on a not-for-profit basis. It's there to really help businesses. So you come here as a business, you get this inspiring space at, at, at good value, but it's more than that. We have the business support services to build a company around you without you having to employ loads of staff. So it's really valuable to companies that are either at just at the idea stage, looking to validate their ideas, or a bit further on and ready to grow and wanting to support with that growth. So that's what we're all about, and that's why we're enthusiastic supporters of Tech City, of course, and um, Johnny and the team's vision. Um, and that's why we're delighted to be hosting this event. So thanks again for coming. And if you know anyone you think could benefit uh, from talking to us, or if you yourself think you could benefit from talking to us, then please do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yes, like Ben is saying, if you are one of those people who are sort of building a 
coming out of your bedroom, out of your sitting room, out of your study. Don't do it in sort of sort of painful silence or on your own. These centers are centers of collaboration where there are people just like you who are building things just like you and could benefit from your skills and you can meet them. So please go speak to Saffron, who's over there. Or to Ben, they're really friendly people, they look scary, but they're really friendly. <laughs> I just want to learn what's happening here, what's on offer, how do I get involved, how to get started. Go and talk to them, really, really wonderful gang. But to the main event. So um, guys, like I said, so Nathan, wonderfully, very kindly and graciously, came and spoke on, on Pitching for Success. This time we were just marveling two years ago, we've been marveling at all the changes and all the stuff that's been happening. And um, yeah, Nathan's, Nathan's an unassuming looking man. But he's also a great man, and what's really wonderful is, you know, what I really want to, I guess, impart to you guys if you listen to this this evening is, Nathan didn't have to do this. You would have to pay good money to get this kind of expertise. This is no kind of small kind of community class put on, you know, by the council, which is boring and fuddy duddy. Like this is good quality stuff. I'm gonna have a nice lady from the council. The council are wonderful, but we all know the council is boring, right? You know what a boring class is like. This is not one of those things. So what I would really exhort you guys to do is two things. First of all, I really don't, I don't know how, maybe it's just by smiling, but look animated, be thankful. He didn't have to do that. And first of all, I'm thankful you guys came out and didn't have to sit down and watch a BC period drum. You made the effort to be here, but you didn't have to do it. So make much of it. Don't sort of just sit there weakly in a kind of British way, just staring into the screens of the ether. Make much of this expertise which is here. Listen, write it down, think of questions. We all know that annoying dead silence at the end when you go to any questions, does anyone want to stand up? And everyone just sits there mutely, right? Get involved. Nathan did not have to do this. He kindly has come there, so you can get value from it. And think about it. Even if you don't have anything that you need to learn, but write stuff down to tell your peers, your friends, your family. There are other people other than yourself who can benefit from what you've seen here tonight. So just be really intentional. And um, if there are any sort of technical mess ups or anything like that, there are. See, uh, Sussex Innovation is rock solid. There are no problems at all. Just be really gracious and bear with us because it's you know, free events and everything. So, guys, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nathan Gold. Over to you. So I want to make you a promise right now, and I won't waste your time. I think John kind of alluded to that a moment, but I will not waste your time here for the next roughly 60-ish minutes. I'll stay as long as you want. If you want to stay longer, I'll stay. I'm going to give you a link to the presentation that I'm going to use up here at the end, so you don't have to worry about taking copious notes, although I don't have many words on my slides that you'll see. I also will take questions anytime you want. I want to start with this quote because I am a big believer that if you're really prepared for anything you do, you have a much better chance at success. And so Benjamin Franklin's been a favorite of mine for many, many years. And what I love about this saying is that what I do for clients more than anything is prepare them for the unknown. Prepare them for things that they've never been involved with before, like how do you ask for a half a million pounds from an investor, when you can't even borrow 100 pounds from a friend, and things like that. It takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to stand up in front of an investor and ask for money, and then be able to handle all those questions that come in after you ask, because you don't usually get a check when you first get that question, do you? So this talk is not just for people looking to raise money. This is literally for anyone who is trying to be more compelling and more effective communicating their ideas so that people care. Whether you're trying to convince an investor to invest in your business with money, or whether you're trying to convince your executive at the company you work for to allocate two more people to do the to implement the idea that you just came up with, you're all trying to persuade people, and this talk is gonna help you with that piece of life. How you can be more persuasive. But before I can do this with you, let me uh, just quickly, very, very quickly. I've given over 15,000 presentations in my career. Started in 1980. And in those last nine years, I've coached over 150,000 people just like you. With over 12,000 hours of one-on-one coaching. So hopefully, 
the things I share with you come from a position of experience rather than just theory. In fact, you won't hear any theory tonight. Uh, I'm not into theory. And along with incubators like this, I've been around the world, and I continue to travel around the world. And most importantly, these days, I'm now actually getting calls from TED Talks, people that are doing TED Talks, and I just love <coughs> those kind of calls. I usually do those pro bono, for free. So if you know anybody that's doing a TED Talk or a TEDx Talk, I'm still giving that away for free for the rest of this year. In fact, up until February's TED next year. After that, I might start charging. I'm gonna get maybe two or three more on this list. If there's time at the end, I'll tell you the story about Evan Tan, because most of you know that TED Talks run about 18 minutes long, right? Did you know that they actually go three, six, nine, 12, 15, or 18? Evan had a three minute talk. We'll cover it at the end if there's time. Now, the information I'm gonna share with you here tonight is really simple. It's so simple that after a long day, I need to kind of mess with your head a little bit, play a little game with your brain, do you mind? Because no. the information I'm gonna share with you is so simple, if I don't get you in the right frame of mind, you're gonna look for more complexities here. There really are no complexities. All right, so if you're willing, I'm gonna put a sentence up here on the screen. Read the sentence to yourself, just once. Don't try to figure out what it means, just read it once. Try to figure out what it means. Okay, remember <coughs> once, at least once. Some of you have probably read it three times by now. Okay, I'm gonna take it away. I'm gonna put it back up here, and in, in just this complete silence, I want you to count all of the F's that you see in that sentence. Okay? Remember, it's gonna be simple. No complex, there's no trick. <laughs> now, adults like to make up rules. So here's a rule that you do not, you, uh, several rules don't make up. There's no F's inside the uppercase E. <laughs> those don't count, okay? I'm literally looking for those things, uppercase F's. That's why all the letters in the sentence are in uppercase. There's also no black text on a black background. And there's no white text on a white background, so the answer's not infinite. Okay. All right, and then the last thing is, the F can appear anywhere in the sentence. Do you need any more help? <laughs> okay, when you have your number, I'll, I'll just let you find how many you have. You can feel free to double check yourself if you want, but don't share the number with the person next to you. Does anybody need more time? All right, <laughs> could you all stand up for a minute? Thank you. Now watch what happens around the room. We were all looking at the very same sentence, weren't we? All of those of you who saw one, two, or three Fs, that's your number. Could you please sit down? Look around, folks. Why aren't we all sitting? How about four? How about four? Did you, you saw four, sir? You saw four? How about the, anybody else saw four? How about five? You saw five? Still people standing? What did they see you didn't see? Six? Everybody should be sitting. If you're still standing, then we have to have a talk after. <laughs> <laughs> They're right there, folks. They're staring you in the face. I didn't stand in front of the screen when you counted them. And because we don't have a lot of time, how about, how about uh, this one? That one. Oh. That's how simple tonight's going to be. <laughs> the, the things I'm going to share with you about communication skills and pitching skills and persuasion skills, frankly, it's all been said before. It's in the books, it's on videos, it's go to cl classes. So why are we here tonight? You're still looking for more. You're still looking for more ways to, to be more compelling and better. I'm gonna give you at least one more F tonight as it relates to your ability to be a more effective communicator, whether you're a startup, a scale up, or you just work for a normal company, or maybe you're thinking about being a startup. Every one of us have ideas that we need to communicate to other people, 
And I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of tools tonight to help you with that. Five specifically, five areas. The reason why you miss those Fs is a separate master class. I'm not qualified to carry that class. You need a PhD MD to come in here and explain to all of you why you missed those Fs. But before I go on, I know that many, many of you are finding yourself rubbing shoulders with investors. And if we had more time, I would ask you to define what an investor is to me right now. But my guess is you're probably going to say that an investor is an investor. They invest money. And that's partially true. But investors are full of a lot more than money. So I want you to think that every time you meet an investor, whether you're raising money or not, you want to be, fr be friendly to that person and see if you can get them into your network because investors have tremendous resources. Maybe they have an office space that you can use for half a year, and they're willing to give it to you even before they invest in you. And then after, I mean, there's all kinds of resources available to you afterwards, too. So the traditional investor is full of more than just the money. There are two other kinds of investors also. Your customers, your partners, your strategic alliances that you're making with people, these are investors, too. Whether they give you money or not, they're investing time in you. When you go along Lean Startup and you go out there and you find 10 customers in the first week to have an interview with, those people are investing in you. Okay. So realize that just about everybody you meet is an investor and the rest of the world invests when you listen to what they are saying or when they listen to what you're saying or they read your advertisements, they download your application. They're investing in you. So literally everybody you meet is an investor. Everyone here is an investor. Primarily, you're investing in yourselves too, which is good, a good thing. All right, so let's get into the material. <coughs> I just came from Norway and Sweden, where they have this Jantelopen and Jantelopen thing where you're not supposed to stand out. It's like frowned upon. How is it here? You okay to stand out? Very yes. much so, yeah. Perfect, and we don't have to talk about that. Th that's changing a lot after five years of seeing the Norwegians growing in terms of what entrepreneurship can do for their country. It's, that, that word is barely even spoken anymore. But what I wanna share with you here tonight are techniques and tools that you can use to stand out, but in a positive way, not in a gimmicky way. I'm not gonna teach you a trick to jump up and down like crazy Americans do in front of some audiences, but real solid tools that you can use to be more persuasive and stand out with everyone that you communicate with whether you're trying to get something from them or whether you're giving them something. Either way, you still need to be persuasive. And if you're not standing out in this world of startup land, then you're just going to get lost in the noise because there's probably five other companies within 50 kilometers of this place that's probably thinking of doing something like what you're thinking about doing. And they may be three weeks ahead of you or three weeks behind you or three years ahead or three years behind but you still need to stand out, and the tools I'm gonna to share with you right now will help each and every one of you stand out among each and every one of you. There's no formula, there's no methodology that I'm gonna give you right now, no magic. <coughs> Just do these three things and you'll all stand out. But if I asked all of you to come back here in the morning and present something to us, you would all be able to stand out individually in a positive way using the tools and techniques I'm gonna share with you right now. So, five things. I want to start with value propositions because this is one of those areas that many startups spend a lot of time in and I feel like they're missing out 80% of the value that they spend time in when figuring out what their value propositions are. Whether you're going through Lean Startup or whether you're doing it on your own, you need a value proposition. Now that doesn't stop, it's actually there's an S on there on purpose. Remember you have three main groups of people you're talking to, investors, customers, and the rest of the world you might need three different value propositions because some of you meet on the train that looks over at you and asks you, wow, you dress so cool, what do you guys do there? You need to be able to answer the question with maybe a value proposition that they would appreciate versus coming to a room like this and most people are startup minded here, you're probably gonna switch your value proposition just a little bit and then if we were wearing name badges, and it had a red tag on it that meant I was an investor, you're probably gonna tweak that a little bit more for them. Very rarely do you come up with one value proposition that fits all audiences. 
So it's really important that you be flexible on how you structure your value propositions before you actually just blindly use them with people. And there's a lot of talk about value propositions, but let me begin with the story of John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy touring NASA in Cape Canaveral in 1963. I have a true story. Everything I share with you is true and verifiable from that. I just want you to know that. I've been doing this too long to make things up. And he stopped the tour and he walked over to the gentleman on the side of the building and he asked the man, what do you do at NASA? And he looked up at the president and he said, Mr. President, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Now here's how most entrepreneurs would answer that question. Mr. President, can't you read? I'm the head janitor. All of the people report to me here. We have two fleets of vehicles. We got the EV vehicles over there, we got the diesel vehicles over there, and blah, blah, blah. So the person falls asleep with their eyes open. And that's not the purpose. You don't want to shove an elevator pitch into somebody's ears when you meet them for the first time. <coughs> create a dialogue, see if they're even interested. Maybe ask a question. All of you are metaphorically helping to put a man on the moon. All we have to do is just abstract out what you're doing, maybe two or three levels up, and look down and say, wow, we really are saving lives here, aren't we? even though you're doing a mobile app. <laughs> so the value proposition, a format I want to introduce you to comes from Steve Blank. Many people have been through the Lean Startup, they still don't know Steve Blank's value proposition format. When you learn it, you'll see how easy it is. If you don't know Steve Blank, he's the grandfather of the Lean Startup movement. And he's a professor at Stanford, at Berkeley, and I think one School of Economics? He's the one of the... And he got so tired of startups coming to him going blah, 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 just blah, 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 and still not knowing what they do. He said, just tell me this. Tell me who you help, what you do for them, and how you do it in one simple sentence, and then we can have a conversation. So the format, this format for a value proposition has four parts to it. The first part is the we help part. Okay, I don't want all 65 of you to say, we help, we help, we help. Some of you increase, some of you improve, some of you maximize. Use the word that applies to what you're doing. And then for the other parts of it, the only part of this sentence you really must have is this part, the what. You can leave out the who, you can leave out the how, and hopefully they'll lean forward and say, how do you do that? Or who do you do that for? Who are your customers? And then you turn a monologue into a dialogue. Okay, and the faster you can turn these monologues into dialogues, I believe the more success you'll have with everybody you meet. So feel free to use this. What I'm hearing from investors these days is they want to know before you say we help blah, 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 they want to know are you a mobile app? Are you a SaaS platform? I mean, what are you? So some investors, not all, would want you to say, we're building a mobile app that helps people, and then you go on with your sentence. Okay. You could leave off the mobile app part of it if you want to. Depends on the audience, of course. Any questions so far? Okay. So here's a part of my value proposition. When I bump into people and they say, what do you do, Nathan? The taxi driver asks me what I do. I say, I help people prepare for high stage presentations. That pretty much covers it. When I first started doing this nine years ago, I used to tell people, I prepare people for presentations. How exciting is that? There's hundreds of people that do that. And then in the second week, I went to a session like this and I was listening to a guy like me, and he threw out the word high stakes. Now some of you are involved in some pretty high stakes work, right? And I go, high stakes, that's the word I've been missing. So when you put, a wor put words in here like that, you you can up-level the effect, the impact that the sentence has on the people that you use it with, because my competitors are not saying high stakes. You kind of own those words when you start using them. So it's not trademarked, it's not registered, but my competitor isn't going to say, oh, we do high stakes presentations without saying two. <laughs> if I was around a bunch of pitch coaches, which these days I tend to be finding myself actually, back nine years ago there was like five of us in the world. Now there's probably 500 people out there saying that they're pitch coaches, which I love, I absolutely love it. 
But if you're in a room with me and you're a pitch coach, you're going to hear me say this at the end of my sentence because I want to stand out. And I also don't want to be literal because if I was too literal with you right now, let's say you said, Nathan, man, I haven't invested pitch in a month. It's like do or die. Uh, I don't care what it costs. I want you to coach me. How, did, how, how much time does it take? If I told you literally how much time and we're gonna spend together to get you ready for that, you'd probably say, well, mm, no, I think uh, I'll handle it on my own. <laughs> but if I said to you that by the time you're done rehearsing with me, you'll perform as if you were in a Broadway show, you might say, okay, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so being too literal sometimes can kind of confuse people or not get them curious, and that's what's missing getting people curious, especially when you have something that sounds like something somebody else is doing. And I'll bet you half of you do. Generally, 30, 40, 50% of my audiences have this problem that is like five other people trying to do this too, and yeah, we're different, and we do this, this, and this, but isn't there a better way to fight against them? And the answer is yes. So here's an example of BidSketch, a real company. Their value proposition is create professional client proposals in minutes. Do you think that when they developed this, that there were other websites out there that you could get professional client proposals done? Do you think there are probably more than you could count out there now? So when you look at this one, are there any fancy words in the sentence? No, it's in minutes. And that's the impact. The impact, the benefit, the result of what you're doing is very often missing from your mouth. You tell people what you're doing, but you don't say the impact of what you're doing. And that's the impact right there. In minutes, that tells you something, doesn't it? Other than the fact that they do something you're looking to do. So their competitors, they have a choice. They can say we do it in hours, or we can do it in seconds. But they can't say in minutes, right? Because they own those words. And that's what I'm encouraging all of you to think, is that maybe all you need is one tiny little word or two words to just up-level what you're telling people, and that's all you need. Speaking of all you need, I am shocked at how much value some of you provide, but yet you try to boil it all down to one sentence, like I'm trying to get you to do, but all the other value that's out there kind of just floats. Well, I want you to have this tool now. If there was one tiny little piece of IP that's mine that I made up that no one else has ever said before, it's this. Everything else I'm saying tonight has been said by at least one other person in the world. But this, I know, is mine, and I'll tell you where I got it from. <laughs> the reason I came up with this is because I didn't want you all losing all of the value that you provide and kind of get pushed into the back. So it's a spreadsheet. There's no application to download, and I apologize. I know you had your phone out. What's the app to download? No app. No app. It's just a spreadsheet. I call it a value proposition matrix. There are three parts to it. The first part is you list over here who get value from your product or your service. List them all. Along the top, list the values. Save time, save money, increase productivity, all those values, the benefits that your product or your service gives people. List them all. And if this list goes longer than this list, then flip the table to make it a little easier to work with. This is not a calculation table, so you can pivot the table at any time you want. Then all you need to do is come in here to the cell and list how do you provide this value for this who. And you write it in. And then you do it again, and again. If you provide more than one way, write them both. If you provide three ways, do it for the whole spreadsheet. And then there may be a few cells that don't have any data in them because you don't provide that value to that who. It doesn't make any sense. So you just cross those out. And now what you have is one place to look at all the value that you provide for each product, each service. You might need a separate spreadsheet like this for each product or each service, or maybe even one for your company. But when you do this, you'll realize how you have probably forgotten about some of the value that you can offer. And when you go into an investor's office, I've actually heard some people using this spreadsheet with investors to demonstrate all the value and all the constituencies of the people that they sell to. Yeah, I've even heard people using this with customers. I, I haven't seen them use it, so I can't tell you how they're using it. I, 
So now you can put it all in one place, update it, keep it updated, and then whenever you need to go out and see a new audience, let's say you're going out to see a bunch of medical doctors and up until that moment you haven't really been talking to them, well, go into your value proposition matrix here and see if you can not find the value proposition data that would work best on that audience. That way you don't have to go searching for it. It's all right there. Okay. All right. Number two. How do you actually begin? Most people don't consider that there's a whole lot going on before you actually say, okay, hi, I'm Nathan Gold, and, and then you get into what you're doing. A whole lot of things that are going on, and then when you first start your opening, that's the place I see most people blow it. They, they kill the presentation before it even starts because the opening is weak, or it's boring, like click. Uh, here are the nine agenda items for tonight. <laughs> it's like, do you really need an agenda slide for a five minute presentation? For a 10 minute presentation? Maybe an hour? You don't really need agenda slides. Do any te TED Talks ever have agenda slides up there? Some of them don't even have slides. So skip the agenda slides, unless you're doing it inside your corporation where they for forcefully make you put a, an agenda <laughs> slide. But let's talk about how to actually begin so you can captivate the audience very quickly. The title of this talk was how to captivate any audience in less than 30 seconds. It's all about the first 30 seconds. I mean, once you got the first 30 seconds done, just keep going. If you do a really good, compelling opening 30 seconds. <coughs> so what I want to share with you about how to begin comes from a book that I was handed. Don't bother writing it down, it's out of print. <laughs> you might find it, but you're going to pay a little too much money for it. I'm going to give you the one chapter in the book that I have literally been using in every single presentation since the day I met the book. And it was literally roughly this time, 1980. I had to go out and do a training class to about 30 people. I knew the software, but I didn't know about presentations. And my boss said, said to me, Nathan, I think you're a little green at this. Here, read this book tonight when you're, when you're on the plane. <laughs> So I read the book. It was a quick read. It was great. It was written in the 40s. So the information actually is still pretty current. So the one chapter in the book that, that this author taught me that I, you'll see how I used it on you tonight, is the six signals that every audience needs to hear from you as a speaker. Six signals. The first four should happen in the first 30 seconds. The, the other two can happen any time throughout, as you'll see. Signal number one. You want to let the audience know you're not going to waste their time. How did I do that tonight? I just told you. I just literally, literally tell my audiences, I promise you I will not waste your time. How did you feel? Think back to that moment if you could. It wasn't that long ago. When I said that, how did you feel? Thank you. You felt relieved. Was that you or you? You felt relieved. That's what I want you to feel. I want you to feel like this guy respects my time and this is not going to, I'm glad that it's not going to be a waste of time. So I could almost hear the verbal things that you're saying. A lot of people feel that way, and I don't do it to just relieve you. I do it because I want you in the right state of mind. And the number one question on most everybody's mind when you walk into a room like this is, when is it going to be over? <laughs> it's a natural thing. You need to know when you can catch a train or get home, babysitters, and all of these things in life. You know, It's not just about this room, and I get that. So you want to let them know you won't waste their time. I literally told you, as I said, but you could cover this many ways, many, many ways. We don't have enough time to go into each one in lots of detail, but a second way would be, so thank you very much for your time tonight. I know we have until eight o'clock. By that time, we'll be finished, and then I'll take questions afterwards. So now you know, okay, that's kind of the frame of mind. We won't be done by eight, by the way. <laughs> Start a little bit late. If any of you need to go at eight o'clock, we are live streaming this to the Facebook page so you can come back and pick up on where you have to go. If you do need to go, please, you won't interrupt me if you just have to go. I hope you'll stay, but if we are gonna finish a little bit after eight. <laughs> Number two, you need to let the audience know that you know who they are. This is kind of like a virtual hug. And I've done that with you a bunch tonight. I mean, I know you're in startup land and this ecosystem and learning how to communicate. So I kind of <coughs> did that with you. But if you're walking into an investor's office or a customer's office, 
You need to somehow say something that lets them know that you know who they are, you know what their problems are, you know what their pain points are, something. Just one little sentence. No, you don't have to go into any depth. Number three, and this is a tough one for people that are not organized, but you need to be organized when you're presenting. If you're not organized and you're disheveled and you're sweating and things are crazy and not working and you don't look organized, then that's probably the kind of person you will need to do business with. So the inferences that come from not being organized is not good. So even if you have a trashy car and your apartment or your home is a mess, I don't care, but when you get up in front of people, make sure you look good and things are set. We were here at six o'clock tonight. No one was here except the three of us. We had everything set, the room was all beautiful when I walked in, thank you very much, Saffron, for that. <laughs> but I always arrive at least a half an hour or an hour early to make sure that the room is not a mess because not I can't think. If I can't think, I know you can't think. Okay, but be organized. And then the, the fourth, you need to let people know that you know what you're talking about. This is not a pound my chest, read my CV kind of thing. <clears throat> it's one or two things, one sentence. If you're a startupper and you're in a med tech world and you can stand up in front of a group of people and say, when I was finishing up my MD and then my residency following that, we notice, I mean, that's enough, right? You've established your own credibility and that's what not enough of you are doing. You need one thing that establishes your credibility. You don't have to worry about your team. Most mentors say, put your team at the end of the deck. Okay, fine, put it at the end of the day. But you still need to establish your credibility at the beginning. Otherwise, all these yellow flags are gonna be going up. Like he just said that, I, I don't know if I believe you. Do I believe you, do I believe you? If you establish your credibility up front, you will be believed more, hopefully. Okay, so those are the four signals that have to come right up front. The next two could come, yes sir? I have a quick question, I hope. Number one, how, why does that work? The other Three, two, three, and four are obviously established, but you, you, you're introducing the concept of wasting time. Yep. Why not have a, this, you're gonna find this session really valuable. Why do you put it in a double negative and not one? I can get the same result. Double negative is achieving the same result. She felt relieved, I bet you half of the rest of the people in the room said, <laughs> me too. Woo, yeah. good, so it worked. You can go both ways. Right. I'm not saying this is the only way. Right. So maybe your more positive way yeah. is more suited to the way you do things. But if you just say tonight is going to be really valuable for you, that's kind of a promise. So you, I, I would like you to say, in the next 45 minutes, I promise you that the information I share with you will be valuable. But that the minute, the time, the clock, is what's on our mind. Okay, thank you. Okay. Number five. Usually in every presentation, there's a moment where you just need everybody to come back. You need everybody's brain like ready. Here's the secret to getting them ready. Of everything I've shared with you here today in the last five hours, here's my most important point. <laughs> and then everybody's going to put a new file up, fresh sheet of paper, ready for you. Whatever you say after this, they will hear. Hopefully the things you've said before this, they will hear as well. But if you know that there's one point in your presentation where you absolutely want to make sure that there's a really good chance that you have the attention of everyone in the room, because you know with devices in hand, you never know what people are doing, right? They could be taking notes, they could be texting, they could be doing email, who cares? So if you want them all to look up, just say, here's my most important point. And they'll all look up, just like you're doing right now. But this is not my most important point. <laughs> and then the last one is many presentations I see, they, especially with investor presentations, whether it's a two, three, four, five minute kind of presentation, they end like this. Uh, we're looking to raise uh, 500,000 pounds and uh, click, uh, we're done. Any questions? It's like, really? We're gonna end like that. That's how people just finish. They just say, oh, I'm done. I, I'm done, folks, if there's any questions. You know? It's like, come on, there's a better way to end your presentation. Like one more story, one more anecdote, one more customer quote, one more experience that you had when you had that customer meeting that week that something just, unbelievable happened in that meeting. Finish with something else. Don't just finish with I'm done. But you do need to let people know you're finishing up. So you want to say something like, to wrap up, 
for in conclusion, for in the last two minutes I have with you, there's so many different ways that you can introduce these different ideas. And those are the six signals. And I literally use them in every presentation. And they work. I've been using it a long time. OK, now that you've covered the signals, let's talk about the opening itself and what you can do in an opening that can maybe help you stand out from the crowd. So I want to share with you 10 ways that you can open a talk, or an investor pitch, or a customer pitch, or a TED talk, or anything. 10 ways you can do it, okay? Because most of you are stuck in the, in the first way. Most of you believe that if you just ask the audience some questions, they'll be engaged. And here's how it works. So how many of you have a smartphone in your pocket right now? I'm just curious. Or I'm sorry, how many of you carry a smartphone with you every day? Really? You can ask that kind of a question in a room like this? <laughs> they do that. People do that. They ask just obvious <coughs> questions that don't cause the brain to do anything more like, oh my god, are they going to ask me to raise my hand? <laughs> are they going to make me stand up and hug the person next to me? <laughs> so try to ask questions that get people to say, gee, uh, I haven't thought of that one before. That, I wonder what I would do in a situation like that. I don't know. So captivate their attention with those questions. Don't just feed them a question that gets them bored. Yeah, I have one. And how many used it in the last hour? I used it. <laughs> we could go into a lot more depth on these, but this is sort of an introductory to get you started, and you can figure it out from here. So number two, the second way that a lot of people use these days is imagine for a moment that we just lost the electricity in this building. And then I want you to imagine what we, uh, and then imagine, and imagine, and imagine. It's like, really, if you have to use the word imagine more than once or twice, you're not using the right technique. Imagine should only, once or twice is enough. But if you have to say it at the beginning of every sentence, there's a better way to get people in the state where you want them to go than just repeating imagine, imagine, imagine. Number three, a good number, a good statistic, a good set of numbers can often be a great way to shock your audience or like get them thinking. But don't quote the number everyone else is quoting. Let's say you're in IoT. Everybody know what IoT is? Mm -hmm. Internet of Things? You're in the Internet of Things. And let's say uh, the Financial Times has just written an <coughs> article about the growth of IoT in the last six months. And they're using this number 97%. And now, you walk into an investor's office, and you say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but 97% is like, really, you don't think I already know this? You don't think there's been four other startups that have come in here and used that same number? <laughs> right? So be careful about just using that easy, accessible stuff out there without transforming it into something that's yours. Maybe you can extrapolate 97% and make it mean something else. Make the audience see it in a different way. Maybe instead of 97%, you talk about the 3% that nobody's talking about in a way that lets you wrap back around to the 97%. Give new meaning to the numbers, because it's very powerful, especially if you can shock an audience. One of the best uh, lines I've heard recently, it wasn't a line, it was true. Six months ago, these two Swedes came to the States and they've been presenting by starting this way. So ladies and gentlemen, as my co-founder and I were finishing up medical school, uh, during our residency, blah, 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 to establish its credibility, we know, based on research, that one out of three people working in corporations are at risk for developing type two diabetes, and they don't even know it. <coughs> <clears throat> numbers like that will just get you like, oh my god, is it me? So <laughs> use good numbers. Number four is a quote. Sometimes a good quote can establish a, a, a frame of mind with your audience and they might wonder, what is that quote about? Why are they using that quote? Because when you put words up in front of an audience, don't kid yourself, they've already read them before you read them to them. They have. Most people can read much faster than people read. 
I mean speak, and when you put words up in front of an audience, you can't ask them, don't read these. <laughs> That's the problem many of you have in, in the companies you work for, not startups. Startups, there's, they're getting this message, but when you work in these companies that say, we want all the data, 12 point font, full sentences, and you put that stuff up there and you wonder why people don't hear what you're talking about, it's because they're timing out trying to read what you put in front of them first, and then they're trying to listen to you at the same time, and I know you have rules and regulations that you have to show all the data, but do you have to show all the data? Here we go. Number five is uh, humor. Humor can work wonders, especially if you have a really serious topic. But I would be very, very careful of going down the humor route, unless you're just really good at it. If you can go down to the stand-up mic, uh, an open mic, and go tell jokes for 10 minutes and make an audience laugh, Go ahead, but make it relevant. When I hear jokes in presentations, I love when the joke is relevant to the presentation and that it helps me, you know, whenever we can laugh or smile, it always lightens the load, so to speak, and the seriousness of whatever it is you're talking about. But don't tell a joke just to tell a joke. I think that's a waste of time. And you need to be prepared for it to go over flat. Meaning, like, what do I do if nobody laughs? Number six, demo your product or your service. I've been having my clients in the last few years go into investors' office and say this. They're in the setup of Kit. Well, Kit stays away. I say, thank you for your time. That's all you need to say. Uh, I've come prepared to do three things for you here today. One, I have a five minute deck I can take you through, which will give you an overview. I have a five minute demo, show you the product. Or maybe you want to start with the conversation. What would you like to do? What do you think 80% of the time they choose? They choose the demo. What do you think 80% of the time, what 80% of the time people want to do what? Pitch the deck. So if you just ask, you might find that you get to it faster because you are asking people what's most important to them by letting them choose which of those options they want to go with. You never know if somebody's done a whole lot of homework on you, because obviously with the internet these days, a lot of stuff is available out there. And unless it's on a document that's on your drive that nobody has seen, there's a good chance that if they do their homework, they'll find out about you, and about your company, about your product, about your customers maybe. And maybe they don't want to go through the normal deck, and they don't even want to see a demo because they were at a trade show and they saw your demo three weeks ago, so now they just want to have a call. You go in there and set up a kit and start kidding away and get your clicker ready and it might not be the best thing for the first meeting. And by the way, most of what I'm talking about here today is really geared for that first meeting. The second meetings and beyond, don't know what to tell you about that until you get through the first one. Number seven, this is not a religious use of the word <laughs> confession. <laughs> But whenever you hear a presenter stand up, and you don't hear it very often, you say something like this. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I have a little confession to make to you tonight. And it's not a religious confession. But whatever you say after that, everybody's <coughs> listening. So you know you have captivated them in seconds. Not 30 seconds, just a couple seconds. However long it takes you to say, I have a little confession to make to you tonight. And then you confess whatever it is you're confessing. I'll make one up. No, I won't make one up. <laughs> Number eight. I can make a lot of things. Number eight, on that same line of thinking, you could ask your audience before you share the information with them, can you keep it a secret until tomorrow at noon? You can't ask people to keep a secret very long because with tweeting these days, the world knows what you know before you walk out the room. So. But you can use this as sort of a little gimmick. You say, ladies and gentlemen, I have some research I want to share with you here today. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to keep it secret until tomorrow at 8 o'clock when the PR firm is going to announce it to the, the PR news. OK, can you, can you do that? Sure. And then you'll go tell people anyway, which won't matter. But the point is, <laughs> the word secret is a trigger, a trigger word. We all love to know secrets. We love to know things we can tell other people that they don't know. So it's a little bit of a human nature trigger. Number nine, your value proposition could potentially be that thing you say to captivate an audience. 
I haven't found too many value propositions where that's the case. Sometimes, but not very often. Finally, number 10. My favorite number one way to captivate any audience anywhere on the planet, because we're all wired for it, is story. Just tell a story. A relevant story, a meaningful story, one that I can learn from, one that I can infer something from, one that illustrates what it is you're talking about. But we're often trying to be too literal with the people we're talking to. And behind every bullet, on every PowerPoint, every keynote slide, there is a story behind every one of those. But Microsoft and Apple have done a great job getting us to boil our stories down to bullets that we just read to our audiences, like <laughs> robots, because that's what we're supposed to do. But when you stand up in front of a group of people and just start telling a story, it will automatically engage their brain, automatically, anywhere in the world. It's the best part about it. Okay, so there's 10. You want 10 more? 20 more? There's lots of ways. I just wanted you to break out of this, oh, just ask questions mode because there's so many other things you can do. Okay. I don't want to leave that topic quite yet because there's a big problem in the startup world. And the problem is that most of you cannot stand up in front of a room and say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time tonight. As medical doctors, we are very proud to announce that we have discovered the cure for every cancer known to mankind. Mm -hmm. Right, and your eyes go, so if you have a wow like that, then just say it. Just be literal. The problem is, most of you don't. <laughs> You'll get there one day, you might have a wow, but until you get there, we need something else to captivate the audience, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or one-on-50, 60. So if you can say something that powerful, go ahead and be as literal as you want. But the problem with being too literal is that you end up trying to explain something that's really complex, because many of you have complex stuff to talk about. And if it's complex, how do you boil that down to one sentence and get people to understand? What if your platform is built on quantum mechanics and you meet a bunch of us tonight and we say, so what do you do? How do you answer that question? Do you explain quantum mechanics before you tell them what you do? Because <laughs> probably 90% of us here don't even understand that field. Maybe we don't even have interest in it. Maybe you have something that's really confusing. Any of you have anything that's really confusing that when you tell people what it is, they go, I don't get it. What? Too confusing. Or maybe, sorry, you might have something that's a little bit boring to talk about. <laughs> but it's very exciting in what you're doing. But when you tell people what it is, they go, oh, so what? Or the worst one. You tell somebody what you're doing and they say, well, that's Sounds like Yelp. Why do we need another one of those? <laughs> or the other is, you know what, that sounds, sounds like Uber, but for toilets. <laughs> <laughs> or Airbnb, actually it's Airbnb for toilets. It's Uber for uh, <coughs> chairs or whatever. Airbnb, Uber, and Yelp are the three most commonly referenced tech companies when people try to say, well, we're like Uber, but we're Yelp and we're combining, if you put Uber and Yelp together and then just add a little bit of this, that's us. <laughs> when you pick a tech reference to go after is the first thing you're telling people. You better be around other tech people because most of the people you tell that to won't know what you're talking about. Years ago I had somebody tell me, if you just take Facebook and LinkedIn with a little bit of Quora, that's us. <laughs> that was just when Quora first came out. Nobody even knew what it was but they knew what it was. So be careful about trying to be too literal because you may just finish, continue to get people more confused, more complex. So here's the secret. You ready for the secret to get people out of this state of complexity or confusion? Here it is, okay. Three stories. One, how many of you have been up in this airplane? Oh, you know which airplane I'm talking about? The one where you get to feel weightlessness. It's quite expensive. I'll pay your trip if you'd like to go. I've talked to two people. Have you been up there? No. Nope. You want to go? <laughs> <laughs> Can I pick on you for a second? Please, please. All right. So I've talked to two people who've been up there. 
so I can verify the answer to this question. What do you think it feels like at that moment where they feel this weightlessness or they're playing with water in the air and they're just feeling that most, I'm not looking for a mental feeling, I'm looking for a physical <coughs> feeling, something we've all done on earth that you probably could say it feels like that. Probably giggle like a child. Giggle like a child. Okay, give me another one. <laughs> um, I've never heard that one before. <laughs> Uh, Something we've all done on... Stomach, okay, when does that happen? You have a bump. Boom, right there. Have you ever been in the car, gone over a bump you didn't see in the road, mm. and all of a sudden your stomach goes like this, you go, Ooh. that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like. Have you been in a pool and just floated? Floating in a pool is more like what it feels like. Because that momentary sensation of the bump. But if you really want to feel what weightlessness is like, you go in the water. Okay, so now you don't have to go. Because <laughs> you know what it feels like. And if that's all you wanted to know, now you know. I could give you the scientific explanation, but that would put you to sleep. And frankly, I don't think I could give it to you anyway. Story number two. I'll just play it. Good. No sound. We don't need sound. So I asked the CEO many years ago, what do you do? And he said, Nathan, I'm the CEO of Maverick Surfboards. We do for surfing what the chairlift does for downhill snow skiers. And he just stopped. We do for surfing what the, what the chairlift does for downhill snow skiers. And then he went on. He said, you know, the problem with surfing is that 95% of surfing is this, <laughs> getting out to the waves or ahead of the waves that you want to surf. But we invented an electric surfboard. A little wireless controller that goes on your thumb, you press the button, it engages the motor to get out to the wave or ahead of the wave you want to surf. You're gonna have a whole lot more fun. That's a professional surfer. He's using it to get better. They don't use it in competitions, of course. But it makes the sport a whole lot more fun. Now, what do most people say when they ask, what do you do? We sell electric surfboards. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool, who wants one of those? Who needs one of those? Story number three, and then I'll tell you the tools I'm using if you haven't figured them out already. Six, seven years ago, I was at IBM Smart Camp. They go around the world for the whole year, and you're all, you can all apply if you want. They look for companies that are going to sustain the planet and help this planet in a big way. Anything you're doing to help the planet, go apply to IBM Smart Camp. Big money at the end, but they give you seven minutes on stage in San Francisco in front of an audience of about 300 investors. And there were like eight countries represented there, so they go far and wide when they look for people. I'll never forget it, the fourth guy jumps up on stage. <coughs> And he literally says this to the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I'm thrilled to be here to share with you our machines that we build that turn water into money. <laughs> and then he puts right up here on the screen this thing. It's about a meter long, yard long. Under those yellow housings are micro turbines. And you can see the flappers in the middle. You throw this into any rushing waterway, you tie it off to the side, you plug it in, and now you're generating free electricity. So does he build a machine that turns water into money? What, are you crazy? <laughs> You're going, yeah, hell yeah. I, I'm with you. Yeah, it makes sense, but it's not literal, right? If he stood up and said this, do you think he'd get the same reaction? <laughs> because if you want to buy one of these things, you need to Google canal turbines, because that's what they're called. But he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to be here to share with you our, our canal turbine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I'll have to go back to what I was doing. <laughs> but everyone in the room went, they chuckled, they laughed, they looked up. Now, not everybody could pull something like that off, but he was just one of those guys who decided he was gonna amp it up, change the energy in the room. And I met him a few years later, and he admitted to me that he actually thought of that line walking up to the stage. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's sometimes when the best stuff comes to you is when you're under pressure. The first four speakers, he said, they were kind of good, but they were kind of dry, and I wanted to get the room going. So he just thought of that on the way up, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. what have I just reminded you about? These are those Fs, folks. This might be one of the Fs you take away tonight. I want to introduce you to Sam. SAM stands for similes, analogies, and metaphors. And these three tools 
are what you need to start using more of when people get confused. If, if it's a complex thing you're talking about, maybe all you need is a good analogy or a good simile. Well, we're kind of like a greenhouse where we incubate. I mean, isn't an incubator kind of like a greenhouse? Here's a, a simile for you. If you said, our incubator is a greenhouse, well, then that's a metaphor, right? And then you're going to have to defend against that. Okay, show me where you're growing plants, how do you grow people. But if you say we're like a greenhouse, you can defend again. I didn't say we are a greenhouse, but we're like a greenhouse. Okay, so using an analogy, a simile, or a metaphor can be just that thing you need to get people out of a state of confusion and boil down something that's really complex to something that's really simple. Just make sure that when you use these things, that people know what they are. It's really simple. That, that really is one of the simplest things you can take away from tonight, is when people get confused, if you see people are thinking it's too complex, at th those moments, you just need one of these. And this is what, in life too, how many of you have kids? Um, yeah, you know you use similes, analogies, and metaphors with them all the time. Otherwise, they wouldn't know how to interpret the world around them. Try going and explaining the literal world to a kid. Well, it's really no different with adults. <laughs> when you have something that's really complex in your business and you're trying to explain to them what you're doing, just think of them like kids. Don't dumb it down for them. Don't say, well, basically. Because whenever you say basically to somebody, they're thinking, what, am I too stupid? Just give it to me. <laughs> Some of you use that word at the beginning of many sentences, and I would encourage you right now to drop it. There's nothing basic about what you're doing. Number four. Number four is storytelling. You can't go to a workshop with me without talking about storytelling. This is not a storytelling workshop, but I am going to remind you about something, and that is storytelling is not being done enough. If you want to stand out, you need to tell your story. You just have to figure out what part of your story you tell. <coughs> but your story and your story and your story are all you need. Even if you work together, same for all of you, all of you, all of you. Every one of your stories are different. And if you're looking for a way to stand out, figure out how to tell your story in a way that helps you stand out. And I can help you with that too. That was the 10 second sales pitch, three second sales pitch. So when you go to a TED talk or you listen to a TED talk or a TEDx talk, they all use stories because they're coached to use stories. You should see the scripts that people bring to TED coaches in the beginning. It's all about I, I, we, I, 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 I. By the time they get up on stage, you never hear the word I, it's all about you and the world. It's a complete reversal because it's not about you. Even in your businesses, it's not about you. It's about the impact that you're creating and the results of what you're doing. Okay, why do stories work so well? Two of my favorite reasons are stories work well because you can relate to stories instantly. And you remember stories. I'll bet you, if we came back to this room in five years from now, you'll probably remember a few of the stories you're hearing tonight like the guy that built the machine that turns water into money. You know the beautiful thing about stories is when I tell a story or you tell me a story and now I tell somebody else that story and somebody else tells that story and it just keeps going. It's a beautiful thing. This is my favorite reason why stories are so powerful with investors is they will retell your story. You know, some investors go out and whether they're angels or venture or private equity, who cares? They're all searching, right? They're searching for the next one, the next one that they can invest in, whether it's money or time or resources. If you go and meet one of these people and you tell a powerful <coughs> story, and now three weeks later they get back to their office after traveling to five different countries and sleeping out of you know, in hotels all over the place, and now they come back to their partner meeting. They sit around the table and and they sit down and say, you know, I, I have about 45 companies I've seen since I've been gone. But let me tell you about this one company that started by two guys, literally in a garage. We've heard of those startup people. Mm -hmm. And they just start telling your story. They paraphrase your story without even looking at notes. That's how powerful a story can be. It just floats you right to the top. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Okay. 
Earlier I talked to you about the value proposition matrix. I told you I made it up myself and I also told you where I was, I was gonna tell you where I got it from. I got it from this guy. Craig Wartman wrote a book called What's Your Story? You don't have to buy the book because I already called Craig years ago and asked him if I could share this with my audiences because I thought it was one of the missing tools when it comes to storytelling. And I've read probably three dozen books on storytelling. This was one of the best. He gave me permission and we're actually good friends now. So a story matrix is this. If you're going to use stories, where are your stories now? Thank you for coming back. <laughs> where are your stories? Remember, tonight's not hard. How do you know? How do you get them out? Tell them. Tell them, okay. Uh, do they come from just, I'm gonna think of a story now and just deliver it? You haven't written down any of them? Most people don't. Yes? Associations. Associations. Perfect. So I'm leading you along here. Most of you have tons and tons of stories stuck up in your head, but if you had to go get them right now, Craig says it's like the attic of your home. You have the stories up there, but you really hope you never have to go up there and get them. <laughs> because it's going to be hard to find them. You know they're up there, but to get them, tough work. Especially after year after year after year, or pivot after pivot after pivot, you might forget those stories in the first two pivots, but yet one of the best stories you could tell is coming from the second pivot and you forget it by the time you get to the fifth pivot. Anybody know the average number of pivots that you have to go through as a startup before you find the product market fit? 4.7. That's the average. 4.7 pivots before you find product market fit. I see some smiles on our back. What is he crazy? You mean I have to pivot my company four times? More than four? It's average. It doesn't mean you have to do it four times. Okay, so the story matrix works like this. Again, it's just a spreadsheet. You create a spreadsheet, and along the column labels, Craig suggests just four types of stories: success, failure, fun, and legendary stories. Uh, Craig talks about the legendary column differently than I do. Uh, he and then I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur too, I break the rules like all of us. He wants you to use the, this column for stories that are legendary, that many people know, but when you tell them, it, you're telling them for a point to relate something about your business. That's what he said. I didn't like that idea, so I made it all the people I meet in tech that are famous. So that's what I do in that column. Along the row labels, you all choose what you want the row labels to be, okay? I'll just give you some suggestions here. If you're a startup, you're going to have at least these. So customer, investor, and so forth. And then you use this spreadsheet very simply like this. Let's say you have a success story in sales. Oh, you'll love this one. When I worked at a company in 19... Uh, 99, 2000, 2001. Logical PLC, right down the corner here, or up somewhere around here. They said no, 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 no to our company. They were not going to buy our software. It was too complex. And the salesperson, Brian, who you know, uh, well, he knows, <laughs> said, Nathan, could you just come over here and give them one more demo? Because they haven't seen your demo yet. They've only seen all the other people's demos. And they think the product's too complex. So I literally <coughs> flew over here, took a shower in the Admiral Club, got in a car, whisked off to the appointment, sit down at nine o'clock. We actually got there a few minutes early and I had a chance to talk to the person who was throwing us out, who didn't even want to see us, and thought it was a complete waste of time for me to fly all the way over here from San Diego at the time, to, or San Francisco, whatever. And I asked him a few questions and I realized why we were failing. So when I sat down and gave him a demo, I demoed only what they wanted to buy, not what my marketing department wanted me to demo. Yeah. And that was the big win. I demoed the product they wanted, not the first three products that they wanted as, oh, you gotta show them our flagship product. Well, what if they only want this one? No, you gotta show them the flagship product. Well, I ignore my, most of my marketing department. You do not wanna hire me in your company if you have a strong marketing department. <laughs> because most marketing departments are not that strong. They don't get out of the building. They have no idea what a customer even is. Sorry. So this story right here, 
Logical PLC would run a $1.2 million deal based on that one demo. Well, of course, there was a lot of work done before that. I can tell you chapter and verse on that whole thing because all I did was put a date, a time, a, a, or just a couple of words to remind me to trigger the association back to get that story out of your head. You don't have to write the whole thing down because your brain is pretty good with that stuff. It'll remember. So you keep doing it over and over and over and over and over until the whole thing is filled in. Keep adding to it. Make all the people on your executive management team keep a story matrix. Because let's say six months later, you have to go to a conference and you know the other speakers are kind of giving dry talks and you want a fun talk. <laughs> if you've been keeping track of all your fun stories, you should be able to go to your management team and say, listen, I've got like three or four fun stories to tell. I need some more. Give me some. And they should have some. We all have those four basic kinds, well, at least these three basic kinds of stories. And if you keep track of them, it'll make it easier to recall them and therefore use them. So don't rely on your brain to remember all this stuff, especially when you get to be my age. <laughs> so when you have these three, four, five, six minute kind of presentations that you will end up finding yourselves in, how do you know how much you can get out of your mouth? How many words can you get out of your mouth in one minute? Most people have no idea. And they would, if, if I gave you a minute to come up here and present, unless you script it out and test it, and you'll usually go over or you'll be way under. But one of the formulas that you can use when you're writing a script, even if you're not going to memorize it, but you want to figure out if you can say it in the amount of time you have, most people speak somewhere between 120 and 140 words per minute. So if you start with a blank piece of paper, write in a paragraph, look at the properties, if you're in Word or, or you can't start with a piece of paper and look at the properties. Sorry about that. <laughs> so use Word or something like that. And just look at the properties every once in a while. If you have a three minute talk and you're at 780 words, you've got too much, folks. If you have a three minute talk and you have two, 220 words, you can add a little more. It's much easier to add than chop. When you chop, sometimes it sounds like it's been chopped. So it's much better to start with a blank and work upwards. A couple little tidbits on storytelling. One is the first 10 seconds of your story that you tell is when the mind of your audience is deciding, am I gonna listen to the rest of this story? So make sure you say and do things in the beginning of your story that give us reason to want to listen to more of it. And telling me you're going to tell me a story as an audience member is not the way to spend your first 10 seconds. You don't want to say something like, well, I learned I gotta tell stories. So, uh, tonight I wanna share a story with you about when I was growing up on Long, Long Island when I was 20, back. So, when I was growing up, I was like, <laughs> really, just tell the story. Don't waste our time. Do you know what these things are? Movie trailers? Do you know why they're in existence? Of course you do. You watch the movie, you decide if you're gonna go to it or not. I'd like you to think about this. In your first meetings that you have, especially with investors, Customers, maybe not, but, it, but investors. Make it the movie trailer version of your business opportunity, not the movie. That's the analogy I want you to walk away from. Give them less so that you can actually go back and give them the movie. And then the last part of storytelling is how many of you have not seen the talk on TED by Simon Sinek called How Great Leaders Inspire Action? I'll assume many, okay. When you get this talk, the link to it, please watch this talk. You must watch this talk because it will help you understand why many of you are talking about your businesses, your products, and your services backwards. I don't wanna spend any more time on it tonight because Simon does a whole lot better job on it than I do, but the link to the video is in this presentation or you can find it on TED or YouTube. If you like the presentation, which I believe every one of you will. There's a book that backs up his research and his talk called Start With Why. So please make that your homework. Last thing, elevator pitch and investor pitch. How do you structure one? I wanna give you a new structure tonight in literally a couple of minutes that will help you boil it down because I find that too much time is being taken in these first meetings with long decks and too much information. So I wanna give you a way to turn the monologue into a dialogue very quickly with five questions. I'm gonna leave a whole bunch of stuff out like market strategy, competition, and things like that.
But these five questions over the last three years that I've been testing it with my clients have been yielding incredible conversations versus just a, one of these. Okay, so here are the five questions. I'm not gonna go into them in detail tonight because I'm wanting to wrap up for you here. One, the first thing on an investor's mind is what is the problem of the unmet need that you are solving? Not how you solve it, but if you don't cover this to start with, everything else is out of context. Second, why you and your team? If you don't establish your credibility, everything you say after that could be a question mark in the mind of your audience. So something about you, at least you. It can leave your team for later, but something about you. There's somebody on your team that establishes the credibility for what you're about to say. Number three is the big one. That's where you talk about your product or your service as the world will be when it's in the hands of the people who will use it. So you kind of want to compare what the world is like today compared to what it will be like with your product or your service. If you have traction, you could talk about that there. The customers love it. Don't take our word for it. Number four, how will you make money? And even if you're doing a social impact business or a nonprofit, you still need to make money to sustain your businesses. Unless you plan to have people just donate and spend and they write it off, which typically doesn't happen. So you need to talk at least briefly about how you're gonna make money. And then the last thing, please don't forget, tell them what you need or want. If you don't tell the investor what you need or want, the worst thing you can get from an investor at the end of a presentation is, okay, hey, that's pretty good, but what do you want from us? If you get that kind of response, it means you didn't put the ask in. And if you've done your job and you built the rapport and, and they like you, you should be able to ask for what it is you're asking for. You're there for a reason. You're either raising money, looking for resources, you want a referral, you need some advice, you need something, otherwise why go? You just wanna be friends? <laughs> okay, then say so up front. At the end, what do I want from you? Really nothing today. But we wanted to get to know you because you tend to invest in this, in the kind of company that we're building. We wanted to meet you today so that in 12 months to two years from now, when we go for our Series A, we wanna make a warm phone call to you. We don't have to make cold phone calls. When you get this deck, oh, it's a present, it's not really a deck. There are four example elevator pitches here. This is one of my favorite. It's Smug Mug, file, a photo sharing service. He came out when Flickr was out, and Google, and all these others. And then uh, I'm gonna stop. I do have a, a couple of bonuses, but I'm gonna just stop right there. I'm gonna go quickly to the, right to the end so you have a link. So, in closing, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, and I do want to give you a link to the presentation that I just gave you here, which is sitting right now at nathangold.com forward slash Croydon. It is password protected, because only you get access to it. <laughs> and the password is? Oh, <laughs> uh, so I will leave that up for you and feel free to go in there and use it. Uh, I know Johnny didn't, uh, I didn't clear this with him, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway because I think he would feel all right with it. Before I take questions, I just wanna finish by letting you know I do this for a living. And if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to talk to you about that. I now have a way to virtually coach you with software. All the videos are in place. The points where we interact are in place. And I normally charge $995 for that program. Tonight, for 24 hours, $99. $99. And uh, that's a very special rate. You would normally never see, oh, it's not here anymore. We're not online. Oh, yes it is. There's the page. So when you get here, you'll see the Prezi right there. It's already on the page. Here is your 24-hour discount. And you have a money-back guarantee, by the way. That link will go away at 7 o'clock tomorrow. It's not a threat. It's just a threat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give you $900 off of something that I charge and leave it out there forever. Because I know you're going to tell your friend and you're going to tell your friend. No, it's okay. Actually, pass that link out to anybody that has so thank you so much. I hope that you have at least one more F as it relates to your ability to be a little bit more compelling and effective at the way you communicate your ideas with people. 
and uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the round. The structure of mine? Of your of presenting, sorry. Oh! But you've not touched on your use, which is very big, of language and the way you use your tone of voice and things like that as well, which I think is actually quite important when presenting. It sure is. Yeah, so I had an hour. I could have a five-day workshop. One part of it is your platform skills, how you use your frame, your voice, the proximics of the room. You might have noticed that I've been pretty much right over here most of the time. I'll come a little closer to you if I want to get a little personal, but I never walk over there. So I can't really get into a lot of it tonight, but there is a whole lot more that goes with presenting, obviously. The voice I'm using, I'll give you an example. My voice that I've used with you tonight is not my typical voice. It's not the voice I use with my wife. <laughs> if I did, I would probably be living in the backyard. <laughs> so, in one sense, most people don't have what I call a radio voice, which is that voice that resonates in a frequency range that you just can listen to forever, with woman, man, or whatever. So if you don't have a radio voice, you need to do something with your voice to captivate the audience's attention if, you just, if your normal voice just isn't working. So one of the things I end up doing with people is getting them out of their comfort zone with their voice, playing with tone, playing with volume, speed. If you wanna, if you wanna do some of that stuff, go sign up for an improv class. That's the best thing you can do as an entrepreneur or somebody that's starting a startup, go to an improv class. You wanna increase your presentation skills? Go to Toastmasters. When you're done with them, go to an improv class. Guaranteed, improv will change you as a presenter. Because when I say to you, I, come on up here, and you come up here, and uh, I want you to make up a story about when you were growing up, and blah, 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 you just go do it. And I hand you two things, and you gotta make something up right on the spot, it's like, it just really prepares you. I know I haven't completely answered your question. Other questions? Yes? Um, a few presentations, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, thank you, I'm not in a great okay. tonight. Um, but a few presentations that I've done, you, you kind of you get taken into an office, guys with suits, behind a desk, and you get sat down. Is, I mean, is there a tactic to that? Is it good to just sit down, and is it good to stand up and walk around? I mean, what's the, yeah. what do you do? It's situational, of course. Yeah. Can you give me a little bit more specifics? Are you in a corporate setting? Are you with us? Yeah, so quite a corporate kind of VC okay. type scenario when you've got maybe, um, I mean one one that particularly it was, it was the head guy with his lawyer, mm -hmm. CFO, an investment manager, so you've got four on the table, they're kind of three there, one there, you've got a presentation that you've got, laptop, you kind of feel, as you go in, you get led to a seat, and then you kind of feel that's where you've got to sit. Is it, you know, try and take control? And I would. I would just take control, maybe I'm an American. <laughs> I would just own the room, take, take control. You don't want to piss anybody off. You make them angry about you sitting in the boss's seat when, they, when everybody knows they sit there kind of thing. But use your, your sense of observation and do what you can do to bring them into your world rather than you going into theirs. I mean, you want to get into their world so you can at least establish rapport. So if they're a little bit formal and you want to be a little bit formal, that's fine. And then you can, then you've got to get into your, bring them into your world. And maybe you, maybe in this particular case, you could start by sitting where they, where you think they want you to sit. Then you start telling them the story, and then you just get up while you're telling the story, bless you, and you move over to the whiteboard, where you take out the white mark, the marker from your, yeah, and then you're starting to do a presentation right up there, kind of thing. So, without knowing like exactly the yeah. specifics, it's a little bit hard. But I would do everything in my power to take control without 
it's looking like on big man Joe. Yes, please. So just follow on to that. If you're going to their office to present, mm -hmm. how how do you sort of scope out what the environment's going to be like? How do you before know, you get there? This is a bit like going for an interview, I suppose. But it's how do you know whether it's going to be a really cool first session or whether it's going to be a slightly different session? Is there any? You could ask beforehand for a little bit of information about the people you're meeting. Obviously, I often ask for a picture of the room I'm meeting. And the reason I ask for that is because I want to know what the setup looks like, so whether I need to bring anything extra. So that's kind of a way you could get a sense of, is it a stuffy boardroom looking like thing with marble tables, or is it a crappy looking uh, little corner conference room? So you could ask for a picture. <coughs> you could call beforehand and ask questions if that doesn't create any weirdness. Mm -hmm. Yes? Could you? Um explain a little bit about negotiation as opposed to the pitch. Okay. So let's just say you've got terms that are very important, such as the long-term governance, and a typical venture-type investment model doesn't suit you. It doesn't suit for, for all sorts of reasons, the long-term impact, etc. Okay. How do you position to get the terms that really are important, but also give them something that they really want as well, the kind of returns they desire? Wow. That's a complicated question, Dante. It is. I'm not so sure I have a good answer for you right there. Does anybody have an answer for this gentleman that you want to start with while I try to think a little bit? I didn't know he had a question. You can you, can you may just stand up and ask the question again? Sure. So um, a situation where investment terms with long-term governance are very important, and it's really about how to turn it from a pitch into a negotiation where you get what you need and give the investor something that they really need as well. Oh, oh. Uh, and is this not happening? Are you looking for some magic way to switch it from a pitch to? Well, it, it looks like it could be happening. It, it looks like it could be. It hasn't been for a long time. It hasn't been for a long time. Okay. Do you feel like you're doing persuasive, being persuasive, or are you giving just giving information, hoping that they will turn around and be enthusiastic about what you're? The reality is, what we're doing isn't suitable. I see. So it's really about finding ah. the right targets. Okay. And, and, but it's also about ensuring you're not pushed around on the terms of the governance that is right. very important. Yeah. That sounds a little bit further down the line than I would typically be involved with for most people. And I'm not trying to make an excuse not to come up with an answer for you there, but I, I'm gonna have to really think about what, what could be done there. It's short of using more persuasive language and getting them to believe more in what you're doing. I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you, this was great tonight. Okay, Amazing. thank you. So I was gonna say, it would depend on what stage you're at. I mean, if that's a first meeting, yeah. you know, the purpose of a first meeting is to get a second meeting. Yeah, it's not. Right. And once you're in past meeting number three or four, you should already have established some sort of relationship where you should be able to know the personalities of the people in the room and who that person is that you can flip, basically. So it is pretty much after meeting number three, maybe it's more about mirroring to, to know who those people are that you need to get that, or build that rapport with to get that ally. And once you go around the room and you get those that person, number two person, number three person, that's when you get the conversation to change from just being you pitching to being more persuasive because you persuaded one key person in the room mm -hmm. who now is gonna be your ally to persuade other people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like a sort of a, a team building to get what you want. I do have something to add to what you just said. What I would suggest to you and everyone here, we skipped over, but look at the two bonuses that I left at the end of the presentation. The five most powerful words in the English language. And one of those five, what do you think the number one is? You. You, that's correct. Whoever <laughs> said you is correct. You. So you want to make sure that you're not using a whole lot of eyes. It's more about you and what they get, right? <clears throat> the fifth most powerful word in the English language is because. And it goes straight to persuasion. And uh, there's research behind this. I think it was 1984. Uh, I forget the author's name. wrote a book about influence, how to influence. And the study was uh, he, he had people walk up to a Xerox machine and cut in line. Mm -hmm. 
do my last word. Cut in line by saying, excuse me, may I cut in line to make some visual, uh, to make some copies? So the first uh, study would come up, ask, can I cut in line to make some copies? And 63% of the time, they were allowed to go, just for asking. Then they continued the study. Walk up. <coughs> May I cut in line because I need uh, because I need to make some copies. Ninety four percent of the time <laughs> they were able to cut in line. The last part of that story, crazy. May I cut in line to make copies because I'm in a hurry? Aren't we all in a hurry? Ninety three percent. So if you want to be more persuasive. Use because, because you're giving the reason behind the things that you're saying. Whatever you say after because is the reason. And a lot of times we don't make a decision because we haven't given it a reason. So use more use, use that because, and you might find that that because gives people, uh, oh yeah, okay, uh, no. Or they are more, you're being more persuasive. Sir. Can you keep a secret? I certainly can. Yeah. I have a little confession. <laughs> <laughs> Nine out of ten times in a high stakes presentation, I say the wrong thing and it goes completely to plot. Okay. I just try and go through all your things. So that was, uh, you got the question. It was a joke. I think it landed. I was sitting yeah. down in a demo of it. It was, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. it was wicked. But you know, so the serious part of it was is a lot of us are going to internalize this information. We're going to absorb about 7% of it, 10% of it, whatever. But I'm going to use it. But we're probably going to fluff. question to you, a genuine question was, what do we do in those moments when something goes a bit wrong? Do you have any good quick techniques? You know, it might just be as simple as take a pause or find the water. Do you have any good just quick spot techniques all of us will use when we say the wrong thing by mistake or it doesn't go quite as we want to? What are just tips you could all use? Sure. Well, the more you rehearse what you want to do, the more prepared you'll be, the less chance that will happen. But it will happen. So my number one go-to technique when I mess up in front of an audience is I self-deprecate. I start taking the blame, I start making all kinds of reasons, not, not sounding like I'm making excuses, but I'll take the blame for it not working. I won't look at the audience like some comedians do and say, hey, why aren't you laughing? That was pretty funny, wasn't it? Kind of thing, we never do that with an audience. So I try to take the responsibility for it not going well. I didn't get enough sleep last night, I'm a little jet lagged, whatever it may be. But the other things you actually said are exactly what I would do. Take a pause for a moment, get some water if you need to, and then you could actually say to the audience, you know, I don't think I started off on the best foot with you here today. I'm gonna try a different way to start out. And then you use a more tried and true method. Don't try to repeat the same thing, of course. So those things might help, but definitely the take it on as your own problem seems to make the audience feel more for you. If, especially if you're not just making excuses. Last question. Uh, and then I'll hang out for anybody who wants to talk to me. Just uh, <coughs> following on, so you've had your first meeting from Fantastic Smash of Hits, have you used all the six kits? Yep. Here we are. Yep. Second meeting, do you have a strap line? Do you have a, a way of forwarding progress to almost confirm the second meeting in the back before you leave the room? Because a lot of us, after we've left the room, or you don't book that second meeting, yeah. or have something down before you leave the room, email communicated, time lost, they don't reply. Sure. Well, now you're getting into a whole topic of negotiations and objection handling. And I'm really tonight, but I would encourage all of you to realize that you're in sales, folks. Persuasion, sales, is all the same thing. You might not want to use the word sales, but you're, every CEO in this room is in sales. So you need to learn to be more persuasive, you need to learn how to handle objections, and you need to learn how to create opportunity, like you've just described. Hopefully, you shouldn't have to force it, right? If you have to force it, then something's not right. But if the meeting's going well, the best outcome you can have is for them to say, hey, can we get another meeting with you next week or the week after? I mean, that's the best, right? They ask you. If that doesn't happen, there's probably a little clue right there. If you haven't been able to get them to ask you to come back, then asking for another meeting might be too premature. 
And so you might not want to push for that next meeting. You might want to take a different strategy, uh, maybe help them some way. If you don't get that second meeting, it's not over. Some people need a few months to get to know you. Some people need to talk to a partner before they set up another meeting with you. There's tons of things that you could do. And then when they say, if you said to them, let's say you're a little pushy, I'll pick on you a bit. So uh, listen, I, I thought today went really well. Do you guys think it went pretty well? Yeah, good. Okay, well, so I'm gonna be back here next um, Tuesday and Thursday. Which of those days would be best for you? Because I'd really like to come back and continue this conversation. And they look at you just like that. Like, boy, they're really closing for another meeting, right? On. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta be very careful of that. But if they said, you know, we don't invest in people like you. Are you just gonna say, okay, sorry, Polly? No, of course not. I mean, that's just an objection. Okay, great. Thank you for telling me. Whew. Glad we got to know really quickly. I, I really appreciate that. And I won't bother you at all. But I'm just curious, before I leave, is there anybody in your network that you think might be interested in what I just showed you? No. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for your time. I won't send you anything. Hope I run into you in the future. And just cross them off your list. No matter who they are, there's a lot of other people out there who will believe in your vision, who will come onto your camp, and then find those people, and then read books on objecting them. Anyway. <laughs> Can we just give a round of applause? So Nathan was too polite to dwell on that slide, but I actually want to make much of that last slide because was it democoach.com backslash poison? Yep. So I didn't know that was going to happen or whatever, but you, you heard it, this pitch. So for $99, which is a steal, what's that, like £70? I'm not very well traveled or sophisticated, so I'm not good at my conversion rates. But think about, you've seen this for an hour. I feel like, I feel like you're pre-sales guys. <laughs> um, uh, but joking aside, he is doing this for free, very graciously has come over here. And, you know, he put, a, you know, $1,000 to do this, and you can get this for £70. Now, you know, you didn't come here thinking, oh, I need to part with £70.